All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, letting people just trickle in here as we get started. My name is Jasper Bores, and I'm the student president of the Buckley program. I'm excited to welcome all of you to a public lecture with Vivek Ramaswamy, author of Woke Inc. With corporate America increasingly being used as a vehicle for progressive ideas, there has never been a better time than now to critically evaluate the role the business plays in shaping and polarizing national politics. A founder himself, Mr. Ramaswamy brings a much needed perspective to the table and offers moderation and skepticism in a time when both are in short supply. Before I introduce our guest, I wanna say a few words about the Buckley program. The William F. Buckley Jr. Program is an organization dedicated to promoting intellectual diversity and open political discussion at Yale. We host lectures, dinner seminars, firing line debates, and an annual conference. Our over 350 Buckley Fellows have a wide range of political beliefs, but they all stand united against the formation of a liberal-only echo chamber on campus. By providing Yale students with a forum to engage meaningfully with serious conservative thought, the Buckley Program forwards its mission of a more open and more representative political atmosphere. Especially at a university where the mission is the cultivation and creation of new knowledge, Buck Buckley Fellows believe that all perspectives, including those of the right, must be heard and examined in good faith. You can learn more about the program and for current Yale students, how to become a fellow on our website, buckleyprogram.com. Now on to our guest today. Thank you, Jasper. Vivek Ramaswamy is an entrepreneur who has founded multiple successful enterprises. A first-generation American, he is the founder and executive chairman of Roy Van Sciences, a new type of biopharmaceutical company focused on the application of technology to drug development. He founded Royvan in 2014 and led the largest biotech IPOs of 2015 and 2016, eventually culminating in successful clinical trials in multiple disease areas that led to FDA approved products. Mr. Ramaswamy was born and raised in Southwest Ohio. He graduated summa cum laude in biology from Harvard in 2007 and began his career as a successful biotech investor at a prominent hedge fund. Mr. Ramaswamy continued to work as an investor while earning his law degree at Yale, where he was a recipient of the Paul and Daisy Soros Fellowship for New America. Mr. Ramaswamy was featured on the cover of Forbes magazine in 2015 for his work in drug development. In 2020, he emerged as a prominent commentator on stakeholder capitalism, free speech, and woke culture. He has offered numerous articles and op-eds which have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, National Review, Newsweek, and Harvard Business Review. Regarding the format of today's event, Mr. Ramaswamy will speak for 20 minutes and then Jasper and I will ask a few questions that we've prepared in advance. We'll then move into audience questions which you can submit throughout the event using the Q&A feature on the lower panel of the Zoom window. We'll wrap up at 5.30 Eastern time. And with that, please join me in welcoming Vivek Ramaswamy virtually to Yale and to the Buckley program. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, for that kind introduction. So, so what I'll do is I'll kick off with some relatively uh, informal remarks that summarize the thesis of my recently published book. And, and I'll look forward to having more of a dialogue with all of you, uh, Jasper and Rachel included, but, but with all of you in the audience as well in the 40 minutes thereafter. So I'll give you a, a bit of background on what led me to, to write the book, which is a, a bit of a funny journey that dates back to my time at Yale. So I was at Yale Law School from 2010 to 2013. And it turns out that I, the reason I came to law school was I had been a science guy all the way through. I studied molecular biology in undergrad at Harvard. I thought I was gonna be a scientist. I ended up getting into the world of biotech investing after I graduated, which despite involving working at a hedge fund in New York, was still highly science heavy and science centric. And about three years in, in 2010, I, I decided that I really had an itch that I hadn't fully scratched, an intellectual itch. And it was to study law and political philosophy. And there were perhaps fewer places better than Yale to do that. And so I told my bosses at the hedge fund that I was going to leave. And, uh, and they said, actually, don't leave. Go ahead and keep your job. You can work part time. Go get some autonomy, manage a portfolio for us, and, and go to Yale Law School. If you'll do that, we'd love to have that be the case. I said, great. This is the best of all worlds. So I ended up keeping the job. I went to Yale Law School, enjoyed those three years. Probably the most productive thing about it was I met my wife. She was a Yale med student, my next door neighbor at the Taft Apartments, which some of you are probably familiar with uh, at the corner of College and Chapel. But anyway, uh, I, when I came back to New York, I ended up having a lot more time on my hands because I had gotten accustomed to having the law school scheduled during the day that suddenly was vacant back in 2013 when I went back. So I started a brief career in stand-up comedy. It was a decidedly failed career. 
it wasn't really a career. I did it, you know, in the evenings while I was back to my job as an investor. But one of the things that I really learned, and it was a piece of advice I'll, I'll share with all of you during my time as a stand-up comedian, was that one of the best ways to generate material is to carry around a notebook and write down as quickly as you can. Anytime something really gets under your skin, anytime something really annoys you, you write it down. And so, you know, that's the way a lot of comedians generate their material. I gave it a try. I was mediocre, uh, generously, generously mediocre, I would say, as a stand-up comedian. But that, that practice is probably the number one thing I took away from that short-lived career. And I ended up writing down all the things that annoyed me about the biopharma industry. So I did that during my job as an investor. I type up my notes wearing my work hat on my laptop, but I'd take my notebook to those meetings. And eventually when that notebook got long, the list of notes in that notebook got long enough, I decided it was time to leave and start a biotech company that addressed a lot of the things that annoyed me about pharma, but which I wasn't poised to actually address as just a bystander as an investor. That's what I did. Turns out I kept up that practice of, of jotting down the things that annoyed me. And, and six years later, I found a consistent pattern of things that annoyed me, which was all of my peers in the elite business world and amongst the investor community, amongst fellow CEOs, were all of a sudden in about 2019, issuing the same carbon copy statements as though they were drafted by the same PR consultant about how they were no longer going to just serve their shareholders, but they were also going to serve their stakeholders and society at large and address disempowered communities and address one social injustice after another, generally ones that rhymed with addressing racial or gender-based disempowerment and something somehow the ways in which those also intersected with solving climate change. The fact that putting the merits of the proclamations to one side, the fact that everyone was suddenly doing it at the same time really got under my skin. And so I wrote it down, blew that out into a Wall Street Journal op-ed that I submitted as a one and done in February of 2020. That was going to be it. But that generated enough controversy and dialogue around it that eventually I decided to blow that out into a book. An agent approached me, said, you need to blow that into a book. That's effectively what became Woke Inc. Woke Incorporated, the book that I rolled out later, uh, you know, at the latter part of this summer, a few weeks ago. And I never imagined that it would, you know, debut at the top of the New York Times bestseller list. But I was grateful for the reception that it got because it turns out that it touched on a theme that a lot of everyday Americans experience, but hadn't yet been able to really uh, you know, been able to really put their finger on, which is the marriage between big business and a newly nascent wing of the progressive movement in our country. And my central thesis in the book was something that I had lived. I wasn't born into elite America, but I had seen it for the last 15 years. And the experience that I wanted to share with people who hadn't been in the same corridors that I'd been in was the simple idea that today, if you're a business leader in America, you pretend like you care about something other than profit and power precisely to gain more of each. And I thought that new trend under the banner of so-called stakeholder capitalism was a real threat to American democracy because it demanded that a small group of investors and CEOs determine what was good for the rest of society at large without going through the normal channels of democratic debate, which was the American mechanism for settling political questions. It resembled that of old world Europe, where in Europe, you might get a small group of church elites and labor elites and business elites that together behind closed doors determined what was good for the rest of society at large. That was the old world European model. But the American model, if it was anything, was centered on the idea that democracy was our mechanism for settling political questions through free speech and open debate in the public square. And so I felt that this new model of stakeholder capitalism, counterintuitively, was actually a threat to democracy, something really different than what Milton Friedman might have worried about 50 years ago, which was that politics was going to infect business to make businesses less efficient. Though I agreed with that to some extent, my principal concern was actually the reverse, that actually the expansion of corporate power was going to render the workings of democracy effectively irrelevant by comparison. And I also worried that as the private sector itself became politicized, democracy would lose not just once in the way that I described, but would, would lose twice over. And what I mean by that is that we would actually lose the apolitical spaces, the apolitical spheres that bind us together across our political divisions, that we live in a divided polity, we live in a divided time in America right now, a politically divided time. But one of the things that brings us together are the baseball stadiums in this country, are the football stadiums in this country, are the theaters in this country, the places where we come together, are places of work, maybe even in the biotech industry, the places that bring us together irrespective of whether we're black or white, irrespective of whether we're gay or straight, irrespective of whether we're Democrat or Republican. 
And my principal concern was as the private sector not only goes progressive woke, but gets politicized, we lose the apolitical spheres that bind us together across our divisions. And if the net result of that is that we're then left with two forms of coffee, as we have today with Starbucks and Black Rifle, two forms of pillows, as we might be with Casper and my pillow, and soon I fear two forms of baseball, as Major League Baseball decides to ad advance one wing of a progressive agenda at the expense of, of many of its baseball fans who might opt for a different form of baseball in the future. Once we get to the moment of two forms of baseball, we're at the beginning of the end of the American experiment as we know it, and the beginnings of civil war in this country, I hope, figurative, I hope only figuratively, but, but I worry could be far worse. Once we have two economies, I don't think we have one America left. And so that was my motivation for beginning to write the book. It's a, it's a message that's equally intended for liberals as for conservatives, though I am unabashedly writing as a member of what I think of at least of, as filling a vacuum in the conservative movement to define what it means to be on the right. My principal concern is actually to define what it actually means to be an American at a time where we lack good answers to both the question of what it means to be a conservative or what it means to be an American. And I worry the way in which this new nascent, what we call woke culture, a, a theory that posits invisible power relationships based on our genetically inherited attributes along the axes of race, gender, and sexual orientation. I worry what that's done to not only our conception of one another as Americans, but the new culture of fear that we've created around even debating those very ideas, where today, especially when supercharged with the muscle of corporate power, one may rightly fear for losing one's own job for being able to both express oneself freely as a citizen while reliably being able to put food on the dinner table. And, and to me, America isn't a country that forces you to choose between speaking your mind freely and putting food on the dinner table between the First Amendment and the American dream. We are the quintessential country where you get to enjoy both of those things at once. And, and what I worry most about, whether you're on the left or on the right, is this new culture of fear that prevents us and precludes us from being able to discuss these ideas, the theories of woke identity out in the open. Because today, if you disagree with any of those woke claims, you risk being called a racist. And there's no greater damnation in modern America than to be called a racist. So when given the choice between being tarred with that scarlet R and risking your job or risking the grade that your kids get in class at school and bending your knee to this new religion, everyday Americans are choosing to bend the knee. And, and a big part of the answer to why traces, in my opinion, back to the moment where wokeness got merged with capitalism, where it got supercharged with the potency of capitalism. That dated back to the 2008 financial crisis. That's a big part of the story I tell in the book, where after the 08 crisis, what you actually had was a fissure between two wings on the left, where you could think of as the Bernie Sanders left and the AOC left, the Occupy Wall Street left and the identity politics focus left. The Occupy Wall Street left really wanted to take aim at wealth redistribution in this country, take money from those wealthy corporations and redistribute it to poor people. But there was a newly ascendant identity politic focus left that said, actually, the real problem wasn't economic injustice or poverty. It was racial injustice and misogyny and bigotry, which served up on a silver platter the opportunity of a generation for big business in this country to go from being the bad guys by definition to possibly being the good guys if they just leverage their corporate power in the right way. And there began the trend of diversity and inclusion efforts in corporate America, diversity and inclusion, not on the basis of ideology or political belief, but on the basis of race, gender, and sexual orientation. There began the practice of appointing token minorities to boards or musing about the racially disparate impact of climate change after flying to Davos on a private jet. This was actually pretty easy for corporate America to get on board with, so long as it allowed them to put Occupy Wall Street up for adoption. And so speaking as a millennial, the story I tell in the book is, one of how a bunch of big banks after 2008 got in bed with a bunch of woke millennials. Together, they birthed woke capitalism and that, that allowed them to put Occupy Wall Street up for adoption, a trend that then spread to Silicon Valley, which agreed to do the same thing, censoring or moderating content online that the newly nascent progressive left did not wanna see on the internet, but not doing it for free, effectively expecting that the new left would look the other way when it came to leaving their monopoly power intact. And then you have Coca-Cola, talking, you know, and the rest of United Airlines and Nike and the NBA following suit, rather condemning 200, slavery 250 years ago if you're Nike, than to reduce your reliance on slave labor today, 
rather talking about voting laws in Georgia if you're Coca-Cola than to talk about your own product's impact on the nationwide epidemic of diabetes and obesity, including in the Black community that they profess to care so much about. That became the new game that corporate America played. And, and the last part that I'll sort of lay out here, which is a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit of an untold story, but I think is probably one of the most important parts of the story is that that arranged marriage between the new woke left and, and the big business interests in this country ended up not being just a bilateral arranged marriage. What I think of really is more of an act of mutual prostitution that led to the birth of this woke industrial complex, but actually a three-party affair. And that was the third party that got in on that act in recent years was the Chinese Communist Party, which recognized that if corporations could become vectors for advancing social values, they wanted in on the act as well. And that's effectively how China and the story of how China has co-opted companies ranging from Disney to Nike to BlackRock to the NBA to relentlessly criticize the United States, but to refrain from criticizing the CCP because they build a great Chinese wall that prevents you from entering the Chinese market if you criticize in true human rights abuses in China, but actually roll out the red carpet if you do that while also criticizing the United States. And, and that behavior has actually turned on its head the philosophy that was that was in vogue back when I was in, in your guys' seats back in the 1990s and early 2000s, the idea that, the, that we could spread democracy through capitalism, democratic capitalism, the idea that we could export Big Macs and Happy Meals and thinks we, we'd spread democracy in the process, that we could use our money to get them to be more like us has actually been subverted in the other direction by using capitalism as a vector in reverse to say that they've actually used their money to get us to be more like them sent back Disney movies and Nike sneakers embedded with the false moral equivalence between Chinese nihilism and American idealism, which is exactly what you're left with when these companies criticize the United States while actually praising China as they commit true human rights atrocities. And if you have any doubt that it's intentional, you could just really listen really carefully to what Xi Jinping and other Chinese leaders say when they're pressed about the Uyghur human rights crisis in the Xinjiang province a million Uyghurs in concentration camps subject to forced sterilizations, communist indoctrination, and worse. Some of the worst human rights abuses committed by a major, na major nation since the Third Reich of Germany. And yet the first thing that Xi Jinping says is that Black Lives Matter shows that the United States is no better. That's actually intentional because it would be laughable, but for the fact that the new international arbiters of moral justice, multinational corporations based in the United States, lend implicit credence to his claims. And so, so that's really the problem statement. I, I think the solution is more complicated, but it's also one that I offer in the book, a combination of policy and legal solutions, as well as cultural solutions that address what I think of as the unique challenge of our time. And, and I know we have a, a group of listeners here who are well acquainted with the history of the conservative movement. I give a lot of credit to predecessors like Ronald Reagan, who had correctly identified that the biggest threat to liberty and prosperity in his era was big government. And he did what he needed to do in his era to fight that threat slashing regulations, cutting taxes, heralding in a revolution whose, whose benefits we continue to enjoy to this day. But, but I also reckon in the book with the, the call of a great Republican from 160 years ago, probably my favorite Republican hero, Abraham Lincoln, who in his era famously reminded us that the dogmas of a quiet past are inadequate to a stormy present. And, and I make the case in the book that the dogmas of 1980 may be inadequate to address the unique challenges that we face in the year 2021, where the biggest threat to liberty and prosperity isn't just big government. Might've been the case in 1980, it's not today. It is this new hybrid of big government and big business that's far more powerful than what Thomas Hobbes envisioned 400 years ago. It is far more powerful than what our own founding fathers envisioned 250 years ago, because each of those parties to that marriage can do what the other one cannot. And I think that is the story of big tech censorship today, where government is using private enterprise under the avatar of private companies to be able to do through the back door what government cannot do directly through the front door. It is what Congress is effectively unable to do indirectly in funding causes that it would rather not fund, that, 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 that say the, the, the party out of power would rather not fund. They're able to use executive power and threats to private companies to fund those same causes instead, something I lay out in detail in the book want to pass the Green New Deal? Well, can't do it through Congress? Great. Use John Kerry as a proxy as the climate czar to get big banks uniformly to sign onto a climate pledge that effectively prevent any bank in the United States from lending to any of the causes that government would have rather banned through the front door. That is the new game of crony capitalism 2.0, not just anymore private companies bribing the government for its own favors, 
but government bribing private companies to do through the back door what government could not directly do through the front door of the Constitution. And I'll close with that reflection of, of what that means for the future of the conservative movement in this country. It's in a complicated place, and, and there are no easy answers, where for the last 40 years, government has the conservative movement has, has effectively guarded the castle of capitalism from the front door to effectively prevent it from being invaded by US big government through that front door, perhaps successfully, while missing the fact that that castle was invaded through the back door from forces ranging from the newly nascent woke progressive movement in this country, neo-Marxism to even old school Chinese Communist Party. And I think the, the question we ought to grapple with is how we sterilize that castle but without burning the whole thing down. And I think that's the defining challenge for not only the future of the conservative movement, but the future of what I think of as a new American movement. And I hope that provides enough fodder for us to kick off in our Q&A to follow. So thank you for having me and, and I appreciate your guys' interest in the book. Thanks, Vivek. Um, the first question that I'd kind of like to ask is, obviously there are you know massive concentrations of capital that kind of underlie what you've identified as woke progressivism. Um, and, you know, there's a handful of maybe VCs, people in Silicon Valley who might be thinking differently about some of these issues. I guess, do you think anything will change until uh, conservatives or people who are concerned about this kind of thing um, actually like develop more of a, a base of capital from which like invest in projects and founders that they feel are, you know, maybe more aligned on some of these issues and kind of don't believe this stuff? Because right now it seems that, you know, if you want uh, you know, an investment, you kind of do have to signal that you're going to continue with this with this tradition that you've kind of critiqued. Look, I think there's some room for a movement in capital markets to, to play a role here in providing a true diversity in the marketplace of products or the melded marketplace of products and marketplace of ideas. As I said earlier, though, I'm also a little bit wary of that as a sole solution. I, I worry that that may create great opportunities for conservative entrepreneurs out there if done the wrong way, though, I don't think it's the right thing for the country because it turns out creating two economies and a private, creates a private sector that no longer brings us together, but leaves us ever more divided. And, and a careful study of the U.S. Civil War back in 1860s, back in the 1860s, I think the path to that civil war began not just with a difference in political views or even a difference in cultures, but a difference in even the two economies that the, that the North and South represented you know, back, in, back in that era. And so I think that both history teaches us and common sense teaches us that the private sector can be a place that brings us together. I think the most important solutions, Jasper, some of them begin with changes in public policy that I advance in the book. Ideas like either getting rid of protected classes altogether or adding political belief to the list of protected classes to say that if you can't discriminate against somebody because they're black or gay or Muslim or white or Christian or Jewish or whatever, you shouldn't be able to discriminate against them just because they're an outspoken conservative or liberal, although the political discrimination is decidedly you know, one-sided today. I think that those are the kinds of solutions, even handed applications of policy that tell big tech you can't have it both ways. Either you're a private company and you're free to decide what content does and doesn't show up on your websites, or you get special forms of federal immunity in working with the federal government. But then if it's state action in disguise, the constitution still applies in return for Section 230 immunity, you're bound by the same constraints as the federal government, including the First Amendment to the Constitution. These are the kinds of policy solutions that I think create the conditions for a cultural revival that we're going to need in this country that, that, that I think goes far deeper than even anything we've discussed so far here, but that I talk about in the book for creating a, a shared American identity that hopefully dilutes the woke agenda to irrelevance. And that's, that's the real cultural revival that I hope to spawn through, through writing this book and some of the efforts I'm working on. So kind of on the same note about a cultural revival, you touched on this, but do you think that this path towards corporate wokeism reflects a broader societal trend of how we're espousing virtue and morality within institutions like big business, as opposed to more personal ones like the family? And what are your thoughts on how specifically this could be addressed? Yeah, no, I think you're spot on, Rachel. I think that what big business has realized is a lot of this isn't just top-down driven. I mean, I give you a cynical account of how Goldman Sachs might avoid regulation by tithing at the temple of identity politics when Elizabeth Warren's a front runner in the Democratic primary in January 2020. And they say that they're not going to take companies public unless their boards are sufficiently diverse. A lot of that is just hollow, naked virtue signaling in return for favors that they expect in return. But I think some of it is driven by a real generational change in this country and a demand where you have a generation of consumers, people my age, millennials, people your age, Gen Z, who 
are hungry for a purpose, hungry for a cause and hungry for meaning and hungry for identity. But the kinds of things that used to fill that moral hunger, notions like faith and patriotism and hard work have receded in our public consciousness. And so you're left with ultimately filling that moral hunger with the equivalent of fast food, going to Ben and Jerry's and getting a cup of ice cream with a little bit of dose of morality on the side or buying a pair of Nike sneakers with a, with a social justice pair of, sho of shoelaces that go with it. That is the, the cheap trivial trivialism is what I think of it as, of mixing morality with commercialism when in fact we morally hunger for more substantial fare. That's the moment that we live in. And so I think part of the right way to fight the woke agenda isn't just to cancel wokeism in return. Something that I worry about a little bit about the the, the use of illiberal tools to fight illiberalism on the left, the spread of victimhood culture from the left to the right, I worry that that's actually the way the culture war may end if, if we don't intervene in, in more purposeful ways. Not with a bang, as T.S. Eliot may have said, but with a whimper, where both sides actually end up joining the same church under a different name without actually recognizing it. No, I think the thing we actually need to do is not to fight illiberalism with illiberalism, not to fight intellectual terrorism with intellectual terrorism in reverse, but rather to dilute the woke agenda to irrelevance by recreating that shared American identity around certain shared ideals and norms that bind us together across our diverse characteristics. And that's hard work, no doubt about it. But I think it's the work we're gonna need, need to do as a country if we're gonna have a country left at the end of it. You talk in the book about how we need kind of a new commitment um, among Americans to serve the country I think that probably goes the same for, you know, our companies. So, you know, thinking about historically in America, at times when we've really had kind of corporate unity behind an issue, the space race, there's kind of an argument that, you know, we've exhausted new frontiers. One of the reasons that our economy is in such a state is that we aren't really pushing new boundaries in science, technology, et cetera. Um, do you kind of agree with this argument or find any value in the idea that we don't really have anything that's kind of pushing our economy in a direction. And that's why we've kind of lost our way with the, with the wokish stuff. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I, if I totally agree with that. I think it's a fine narrative. I, I just don't know that that fits the facts right now. I, I think we actually do live in an era where there's unprecedented technological innovation on numerous counts from, from medicine to hard technology to transportation. I think that there's there's a lot to celebrate in our culture of innovation, but I don't think the cultural problem that I'm talking about here is one that we can innovate our way out of. This is going to be something that requires deep introspection on the part of each of us as individuals in our capacity as citizens, not as capitalists, not as innovators. I've worn those hats, but as citizens, as fellow, as people who are in a relationship with one another as citizens, to think of ourselves in a collective lateral relationship with one another, I think we're in a deep relationship and we have, to, we have to accept that. And I think that we've lost the requisite trust that binds us together as citizens. I don't think that's an innovation problem. I don't think that that's a problem that's gonna be solved by you know, going to Mars next year. That that's almost risks being a form of escapism from I think the actual black hole that's at the center of our nation's soul. And it's gonna be great if we find a cure to COVID-19 but I don't think that's going to cure the cultural cancer that plagues our nation. And I think that in some ways, the, the idea that the answer may be in, in free markets or in capitalism, free markets and capitalism can do a lot of great things for us. I'm a, I'm a lover of capitalism, but I'm also a lover of capitalism to deliver on the promise of what capitalism has to offer while recognizing that it may fall to other spheres of our lives, civic life, family life, religious life, to fill some of the moral voids that we otherwise, that we otherwise miss. And I think actually turning to capitalism to provide those answers may actually leave us in the worst of all of those worlds, as opposed to separating each of those spheres into addressing what each of those institutions is supposed to address while recognizing what each of those institutions can't necessarily address, just like you can't expect the church to innovate the next great medicine that's going to cure the next great disease. You can't expect our system of free enterprise to fill that moral hunger that we ultimately experience as a generation. I wanted to ask uh, one of our audience questions because I think it's got some particular relevance in what you just said. So one of our audience members wants to know what impact can antitrust enforcement have on the marriage between big business and progressive activists? 
the existing regulatory regime, uh, they say, has created oligopolies in many industries that rely on government to protect them from competition. Um, do you think that there's any really relationship to what you've said? Yeah, there's some relationship to it. I, I, so I will say the part that I'm that I'm sympathetic to, and I'll say the part that I ultimately have come around to to taking a different view on here. So the part I'm sympathetic to is I think the problem is definitely driven by big business. The problem being the marriage between the newly nascent progressive left and big business, what we call woke capitalism. I think it's notable that it's actually driven by big business rather than small businesses in this country. And I think that that's used by big business to gain political favors, to codify their regulatory status. I give the Goldman Sachs example earlier. The only reason Goldman Sachs' statement that it won't take a company public in the United States if their board is insufficiently diverse the only reason that has any meaning at all is the fact that Goldman is a member of a small oligopoly of banks that effectively is regulatorily codified with the power to determine what companies can and can't go public because we have an underwriting process that you know ultimately requires that for traditional IPO at least. And I think that that highlights the way in which big business is able to blow what I call woke smoke to be able to actually cover up the accountability that they otherwise would experience from the public for keeping their existing power structures that are merged with regulations that often favor their status as big businesses in this country in the first place. And so I do think that there is a, a real problem of using businesses that control too much power in the marketplace of products to be able to flex that muscle in the marketplace of ideas. But that brings me to the second point where I actually think that's the real problem we need to worry about today. It isn't the John D. Rockefeller problem of using market power to be, get more market power to gouge consumers on price. I don't think we actually see a ton of that today. I don't think that's the monopoly of our time that we need to worry about. Maybe we see some of it, but existing antitrust laws more or less, you know, police for that. And we can debate that as we might, you know, in the law school side of Yale about whether those are even effective or not. But that's a whole separate 20th century debate. I think the real problem, even if we broke up four, the four big tech companies into 40 smaller tech companies, the real problem is every venture capitalist and nearly every startup in Silicon Valley subscribes to the same ideological dogma too. It's not a monopoly on products. It is a monopoly on ideas. And if we break up a monopoly by creating an ideological cartel instead of an ideological monopoly, I'm not sure that solves the problem either. And so I think the real solutions have to trace back to the relationship between the state and private business behind closed doors. When you have big, when you have big government effectively threatening tech companies to say that if you don't take down hate speech and misinformation as we, the party in power, define it, by the way, we can't do it because we have this pesky thing called the Constitution and the First Amendment to that Constitution, but you need to do it or else we're going to come after you, we're going to regulate you, we're going to break you up. Oh, and by the way, we can be partners in doing it. Oh, and by the way, we'll pass this law that gives you a special form of immunity from tort law at the state level, we'll call it Section 230. You know, That's just state action in disguise. And the principle that I advance in the book is that if it is state action in disguise, then actually the Constitution does still apply. And so I think that that's the, kind of, that's the kind of direction I think we need to look at policy solutions embracing. Antitrust may be, may be satisfying in the short run as, as a retributive action against bigger tech companies, but I don't know that it goes to the essence of what we, you know, what we want to see done here. And, and I actually you know, offer a bit of a, admittedly, a conspiracy theory in the book here. I don't know, if, I'm not a big conspiracy theorist, but I actually think that there's a certain way in which big tech actually might view this as the right lightning rod because they know they're going to win the antitrust battle in the courts. They could point to the fact that their, their products are available cheaply, inexpensively, widespread consumer choice. Many of the products are even free. That's really the formula for winning an antitrust case on any sort of contemporary theory of antitrust law over the last century. And I think it misses the essence of what's actually happened is, happened is that they're in bed with a newly nascent wing of big government itself to be able to scratch each other's backs and codify their status through favorable regulatory treatment. So I, I think that's actually where we need to look more. So staying within the realm of the financial services industry, ESG investing has of course become an increasingly popular strategy among asset management firms as a way to show its commitment towards social causes. But isn't it true that it's not necessarily only an example of wokeism, given that ESG has also been used to assess risk premiums and long-term financial sustainability as part of making investment decisions? Yeah, so I, I think the ESG movement in, in capital markets is, is sort of orthogonal, a little bit orthogonal to, to what I think of as, as the content of wokeism per se. The book does span a lot of chapters, but I think they're all more deeply linked about the link between how capitalism is used as a vector to advance certain values, be they values of the progressive left or be they the values of the Chinese Communist Party. But nonetheless, I think that it is worth pausing to talk about the ESG movement on its own terms. I think it is mostly a scam. 
I think it is mostly a response by the actively managed fund industry to respond to the loss of market share to the passive management industry, which was effectively in the form of index funds that charge nearly no fees or no fees, to be able to have the fee charging segment of the mutual fund complex, the Black Rocks of the world, to name names, that effectively created this new movement, the Al Gores of the world and the, the Larry Finks of the world, to be able to empower themselves under the banner of doing social justice without actually having an iota of interest in really driving social justice and change, because Larry Fink is regularly doing the bidding of the Chinese Communist Party here in the United States without applying any of those ESG standards to the environmental practices of Chinese companies while continuing to wax eloquent about what he needs to see from US companies as a consequence, as, as a condition for their investment. And so I think that what we have right now is an ESG linked, the early stages, in my view, of an ESG linked asset bubble where so called companies that get an ESG sticker are able to attract more funds. That then has driven short term stock price performance that at least has at least allowed some tortured analyses. And I debate the validity of these analyses in the book, but at least some tor tortured, cherry picked analyses to claim that ESG investing outperforms normal investing. Theoretically, that, that's actually false on its own premises because. If ESG investing means anything, it means disinvesting from companies that are so-called sin stocks. If you disinvest from a company, that makes the stock price go down or raise its cost of capital, which means that somebody else has to be compensated even more to own it, which means that somebody else is necessarily going to enjoy systematic advantages in earning risk-adjusted returns over somebody who is ultimately restraining their set of investment choices and disinvesting from projects that could earn a higher rate of return on account of actually being virtuous. It's part of the cause, part one of the costs of being virtuous even on the terms of ESG investing itself. But you know, I unpack that argument a little bit more in the book and I'll leave it to, to sort of finance, finance types to, to you know, as, as I once was too, to sort of go through the nuances of that argument. But actually what we see instead is a short-term ESG bubble, not based on the fundamental investment characteristics of being an ESG investor, which is itself purposely vague. What does environmental, social, and governance mean? We've acronymized it much like the DEI agenda acronymizes these acronyms in, in sets of three. They often come in sets of three for a reason. DEI, ESG, whatever you call it, it's purposefully vague as a way of attracting capital to certain classes of companies that then can point to their short-term stock price performance because of the influx of capital, not anything different about the fundamental characteristics of those companies. That's the characteristic of a Ponzi scheme, something that goes up in value precisely because more people are doing it, a greater fool theory version of the game. But what I worry about is that just like the pre-2008 housing bubble that was the product of government policy that said that we want to drive home ownership in this country as a social objective and want to see capital allocated accordingly via Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, et cetera, that prop that up, I worry that we're in the beginnings of an ESG linked asset bubble. But one of the things I do explore in the book is the possibility that I might be wrong about that. And actually, you know, does that mean I'm going to short every stock that is ESG linked and, and has experienced outperformance? If the answer to that question is going to be no, the reason might be that the Larry Finks and Al Gores of the world actually do have the last laugh in the end because the way they are able to outperform isn't by competing in the market, but by capturing government along the way. And if they are actually able to capture government to give themselves favorable treatment by, as BlackRock has done so successfully with the Biden administration, placing its alumni in seats of power and in determining the former chair of ESG investing in BlackRock, because I think the chair of the Council of National Economic Advisors today, if you're able to enact enough regulations that actually complete the loop, then you know what, maybe they will have the last laugh in the end because they're, they're ultimately more valuable firms not because they actually competed in the free market, but because they competed in the government crafted version of that market. So I think that actually may be the most, the, it's scary enough to think that we may be in the beginnings of an ESG linked asset bubble, much like the pre-2008 housing bubble. But the scariest of all is actually, it's not a bubble. It's actually exactly how the system is supposed to work because government makes it so through capture. So those are the possibilities I explore in, in, in one of the chapters of the book. So I wanted to shift gears a bit and ask kind of about your thoughts on the media. So. In the late 19th century, early 20th century America, that was the last time we were really as you know, scared or fearful of corporate power as perhaps you know, some people say we ought to be today. Um, I'm wondering, you know, now media seems to be pretty much aligned or in sync with what the corporate sector is doing, what their incentives are, um, and kind of what they see as the correct set of values to be promulgating. So I guess, what's your analysis of how the two have been brought together and what, what's kind of sustaining that relationship in your mind? And the two, you want to just be really, I want to be really precise, Jasper, what you're talking about there. Media and the corporate sector. Media. Okay. Okay. So, sorry, sorry. I, okay. Because the media, I think of as a subset of the corporate sector a little bit, but yeah. So, so, so look, I think that in the media, you have something else, you have something a little different going on, which is 
not the 75% of woke capitalism that is the inauthentic scammy kind that I described for most of our discussion so far, but, but actually an authentic version of it where, where you have a group of people that say that actually now that we hold seats of power in the marketplace, we're going to use that to advance our conception of the social good. I include some of social media in that category. I put Jack Dorsey in that category. That's somebody who doesn't need more bucks, doesn't need more money. He has plenty of money. He has tens of billions of dollars. And he only owns a portion of Twitter. So if Twitter makes another buck, it doesn't really matter to him. The rate limiter to how much power he exercises isn't the amount of money he has like it is for most people. It is what money itself can buy. And I think that what ironically you've seen from, from this newly nascent wing of, of woke capitalists who are actually authentic in their commitments to their underlying causes is they care about expanding the scope of what money can buy because that's ultimately how they're able to exercise power, far more power than they would have ever been able to exercise as a democratic, democratically elected office holder because they would have otherwise been subject to constitutional scrutiny, constitutional constraints, term limits, and the whole nine yards. So I think that part of what you're seeing from folks in media is, is you have an entire generation of people who have actually been trained in, if I may say, you know, places like Yale that ultimately, I think, advance one particular ideology through education, which actually then traces upstream to the universities, which then traces upstream to, to education, even upstream of universities, that then want to use market power. I mean, the media market is, is not fragmented enough for it to be anything other than a small oligopoly on cable television, on social media platforms that amplify the messages that you get in other forms of media to be able to use that to advance their conception of the social good. And that's what actually, it's a different story than the post 2008 story on Wall Street that, that I told earlier of actually the minority of instances in which actually it's the authentic kind of stakeholder capitalism, where you actually think that you are using your seat of capitalist power to advance your conception of the good. And for me, one of the things that I you know changed my mind on since the start, I, since the time I started writing the book was that I began with an intent to indict the scammy kind of so-called woke stakeholder capitalism. I think by the end of the book, I was convinced that if there was one form that was most dangerous of all, it was actually the authentic kind, where you effectively had a group of leaders that were able to sidestep the mechanisms of democratic accountability to be able to exercise quasi-state-like power. And I think that's what worried me most of all by the end of the book. Talk about maybe specific instances in the past few years that have made you feel more optimistic about the future and how your own experiences as a founder have influenced your views. Yeah, look, I think that uh, I think there there are a lot of glimmers of hope that provide a basis to be optimistic if the right leaders are able to step up and 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 sort of take those openings to to a new height. So so one one with respect to the defeat of the woke movement, which I think is is due in the next decade, in, in the next few years, was actually one of the election, un, un, undiscussed elements of the election last year, which was in the state of California, for example, which had Proposition 16, which sought to repeal the state's constitutional prohibition on discrimination on the basis of race. And the point of repealing it was to roll out the true so-called anti-racist agenda of actually allowing the state to draw distinctions on the basis of race, implement quota systems, engage in racial discrimination. That's a majority minority state. That is a, that is a majority of residents of California who vote are non-white. It is a state that went up and down the ticket for Joe Biden, went up and down the ticket for, for Democrats in that election, yet purposefully voted that measure of the ballot down, voted down that proposition despite being outspent nine to one by Silicon Valley and Hollywood elites who funded that proposal for, to, to, for it to actually pass. And so I actually think that that was an interesting glimmer of hope, even on the left, suggesting that actually people don't necessarily, in the privacy of the ballot box at least, agree with the core tenets of the woke movement that the right answer to past discrimination, and I'm quoting Ibram Kendi nearly directly here, so don't just take it from me. I think a lot of folks you know, on the left sort of engage in a form of intellectual gaslighting to say that, no, no, no that's not what we meant. So I'm, I'm a big fan of using direct quotes. The remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. The remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination. That's what Ibram Kendi has to say, agree or not, in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. I think that's at the kernel of, of pol the policy agenda at the heart of the anti-racist movement, discrimination as a way of correcting for past discrimination. I come from the John Roberts School, where I think the best way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. And I think that actually a majority of even Democratic voters in the state of California appeared to agree with that 
in the privacy of the ballot box, even though very few of them, at least in institutional life, would actually articulate that same principle. I think the number of minorities that, that actually voted to join the Republican Party this year, I, I'm not saying that that's necessarily a good thing or that I'm a, I'm a big fan of the current institution that we call the Republican Party, but I think it, it reflects a greater diversity of thought than the, you know, I would say media elites and even institutional elites more broadly presume to say that actually you can be black and have a political view that may defect from what Ayanna Presley calls the black voice. And the idea of separating one's skin color from one's voice, I think is rejecting a core tenet of the woke movement, but embracing a core tenet of what it means to be American, that the content of your skin color says nothing about the content of your perspectives, let alone the content of your character. So, so I think there are glimmers of hope. I think what we really need is a revival though of a culture of courage that is able to discuss those ideas and advance those ideas in the open rather than submitting to a culture of fear that prevents a lot of Americans from being able to discuss those concepts in a culture of free speech and open debate out in the open for fear, as I said earlier, of losing their job or of their kids getting kicked out of school, as you saw in Columbus, Ohio, where I live right now at Columbus Academy, two kids who were asked not to come back next year. They were effectively kicked out of the school because their parents questioned the curriculum that they were teaching and the racial, highly racialized version of that curriculum. So I think that culture of fear is what we're gonna to need to overcome. And I think that now more than ever, I think every American bears a civic duty to be able to speak up freely in an uninhibited way, precisely when you believe you're the only person in the room who holds the view that you do. And to the extent there's a lot of students on this particular Zoom, I would encourage all of you to live your civic duty by doing exactly that. Don't modulate what you have to say. Be civil. Being civil is different than modulating what you have to say. But without modulating what you have to say, without compromising the heart of your beliefs, to be able to say exactly what you believe in a civil way, I think is a civic obligation that every American bears. And I think that in a majority of those cases, what you'll discover is that when you thought you were the only person in the room who thought what you did, if you actually express it in a civil and unab unabrashed way, the thing that you'll discover is that you actually weren't the only person in the room who thought what you did. I think that fear is naturally more infectious than courage but with the right investment of effort and intentional sense of purpose, courage can still defeat fear in the way it spreads as long as we're intentional and purposeful about it. And I think we live now in a moment where that's more important than it's ever been in our history. Where do you think the culture of courage you identified comes from? Is it gonna come from Washington or is it on the local level where you know things like boycotts are effective strategies for um, you know, maybe it's Amazon or Walmart or another major company that's trying to sort of exploit workers, uh, for example. You know, where, where does this kind of, uh, you know, movement or, or reform impetus come from? Yeah, look, I'm not a big fan of, of boycotts at the, at the end of the day. I worry a bit about the two economies problem, and I worry about using fire as a method of fighting fire. You know, the classic Gandhi quote, eye for an eye leaves, a, leaves the world blind. I think there's a version of that lesson for us here, too. Um, I do think though courage involves people who are willing to make individual sacrifices nonetheless in order for the greater civic purpose that our moment demands. I think I'm skeptical that that's going to bring it begin in Washington, D.C. I'm skeptical it's going to begin with the Republican Party as it stands today either. I do think though that individual leaders can make a great difference. I think Ronald Reagan was one of those heroes in his era. I think we live in a moment in the equivalent of the 1970s. And, and the question is, are we the 1970s with Reagan or are we the 1970s without Reagan? And I think the way this country could go in those two situations is, is really different. And by the way, without Reagan, I don't necessarily mean Reagan's policies. <laughs> he did, as I said earlier, he did what he needed to do in his era. We can't just recite those slogans and imagine that we are gonna solve the unique problems of 2021 by, by shackling ourselves to dogmas from, from 40 years ago. It's like what Dorothy might've said to Toto, we're not in 1980 anymore. But I do think it's going to take courage for people at the highest level, from people who aspire to occupy the White House, to people who aspire to occupy a school board. I think that actually takes a lot of courage, too. I think it takes a lot of courage to stand up to a teacher at a parent-teacher conference. And I think it takes more courage than just being combative. The combativeness is, is, is not courage alone. It can, it can create a new form of pandering that ultimately uh, you know, is a slave to the person who cheers for the last thing that you said, is what, something that I worry about in the conservative movement today, too. I think that what we really need is people who independently are able to adjudicate what they actually believe to be able to articulate that without having to modulate it one iota, but also being courageous enough to listen in return and being able to engage with the best arguments for the other side with an openness 
to revising one's own positions after having heard those arguments. I think that's actually real courage. And, and I think that fear is, is, I would say, more easily transmissible than courage. But I think courage intentionally demonstrated spreads much more effectively than fear every time if the, if the right leaders are, are the standard bearers. And part of the reason I, I wanted to take the time to talk to this group is I hope that some of those leaders are in that audience today. I think that you're part of a generation that hasn't yet committed itself necessarily to where it lands on these debates. And, and my pitch to, to your cohort, if you will, or your, your generation is that, you know, look, as a young person, one of the things you want to do is to be courageous in standing up to the system in standing up to the man, in being countercultural, in being heterodox. And, you know, my generation, the way we did that as millennials was to embrace the, the, the church of wokeness. It was a fringe theory in the academy and wokeness was supposed to be a method of standing up to the system. Well, guess what? Today being woke isn't about standing up to the system. It is the system. It is the ideology that every major institution in this country signs up to, whether you're talking about companies, whether you're talking about universities, whether you're talking about nonprofits, elite philanthropies, museums, the military, that is critical theory isn't about changing the system. It is the system. And so if you really want to be heterodox, think independently about how you challenge that new prevailing power structure. If critical theory is about examining previously unexamined or invisible power structures, then go ahead and do it and engage in critical theory, where I think of as critical diversity theory, engaging in a critical lens towards the church of diversity that governs the social structures that you inhabit today. And that doesn't mean you have views that are mine, but at least make them views that are your own that challenge the prevailing power structures of your day. And, and I think that you know, that generational change and generational opportunity could actually be part of what drives the much needed cultural change that we're gonna need as a country. You talked about my Polo earlier as a company that struck out as a non-woke player. And uh, what do you think that concerned founders and CEOs can do specifically to combat these trends as opposed to just generally disagreeing with them? Are there statements of public interest that they can um, put on their websites or any specific steps? Yeah, look, I don't, I don't know that it lends itself to a, a simple one-stepper. I think that we're going to need a revival of civic education in this country to drive that generational change. I think we're going to need some policy changes that create the conditions for restoring that culture of free speech and open debate. But, but for better or worse, I don't see a single catch-all panacea here. I think it's going to be a, a culture, it's going to be a set of policy changes that create the conditions for cultural change, that create the conditions for people not to be punished for expressing themselves out in the open. But at the end of the day, it's going to require those people to then enter the ring to be able to engage through in, in really the kind of debate and dialogue we're going to need to have in order to find a better way forward. That, that being said, you know, I think I, I don't want to undersell those policy solutions. I think that look, we, we have a culture that provides a lot of corporate privileges through law that we ought to re-examine if those corporate privileges are being abused to, you know, let's just say, advance values or advance agendas that were never previously imagined. I talk about something like the business judgment rule, which protects executives in the case where they're actually making business judgments from being sued for making a bad business judgment. It shouldn't necessarily protect them when they're making social judgments. And that doesn't mean that it's illegal to engage, make a social proclamation, but it means you don't get the special legal doctrine that protects you from a shareholder lawsuit if you do. Shareholders get limited shareholder liability to engage in pursuing innovation for the pursuit of profit. That's great. That's why we had limited liability. But you shouldn't get limited liability if you're using the corporation as a shield to shield yourself from liability to engage in social advocacy, just like you can't use a nonprofit status to be able to get a tax benefit if you're engaging in profit in, in for-profit activities or nakedly political activities that a nonprofit status would prevent you from being able to engage in. So, so I think that there are a lot of technical solutions like those kind of at the wonkier end of the spectrum. I think that there are solutions like making political belief and political expression a protected class in our country, if we're going to have protected classes at all, which is a debate that I'm open to having. Uh, you know, I think those are the kinds of solutions that we're going to need to create the cultural conditions for the civic revival that hopefully then follows, but it's not going to be a silver bullet approach. So you grew up near Cincinnati and obviously Ohio and the area where you grew up in was once very strong for unions and still, I think, relative to the rest of the country is quite strong um, for unions. Do you think like in your division of capitalism and democracy that you kind of outlined as being ideal at the beginning, you know, what role do you think unions have to play in standing up to corporate power? Um, is that something that you would think is kind of a, a tenable aspect, like part of a, a policy It's an interesting platform? question, yeah. Jesper. Let me, let me just throw it back to you for a second. I'm just going to take it as, as an occasion to grab a drink, but what, what, do, what do you think about that question, actually? I'd love to hear your view. It's the first time I've gotten that question in a while. 
I mean, I think generally that like unions kind of inculcated strong families, uh, good social values amongst their members, and we're also kind of part of a social safety net. Um, so in addition to having the function of like restraining corporations from making, you know, perhaps kind of errant decisions sometimes, uh, they also, you know, had just benefits for their members more generally. Yeah, so, so I think that in principle, that's, that's a, it's a thoughtful area for inquiry and reflection. I think that what in practice happens, especially unions and larger corporations, is that they end up becoming administrative bureaucracies of their own. And one of the things I write about in a different context in the book is, is the deep state equivalent in government that is the rise of deep corporate within the private sector, where you have institutionally empowered elites that often betray the very causes they're supposed to stand for. And, and one of the dirty secrets of, of corporate being a corporate executive, but I think it's true about being a union leader too, is that the more people accountable, the more people you become accountable to, the less accountable you are to any one of them. And by making yourself accountable to everyone, that's the best trick to become accountable to no one. And I think that's part of what stakeholder capitalism does is it allows executives to become accountable, not just to shareholders, but to all stakeholders, not just to stakeholders, but to society. Guess what? That actually allows you to evade accountability to anybody and it actually empowers you in the end. I think it's true for a lot of union leaders too. And I think that they're able to, you know, become a member of the managerial class without actually admitting it in the open. And I think that's something that, that I'm dubious of as a solution, though I think the dialogue about it can be constructive because I think, I think it, it pushes, it puts pressure on the right places in the, in the corporate hierarchies. I'm just not sure that that's actually the solution that I would most naturally gravitate towards, but it's, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, I know we're, we're approaching the bottom of the hour, so probably have time for, for, for one or two more questions, but I'm glad you, you threw that one in. Yeah, I, I guess I'd just like to ask one more, and that's kind of in your mind, are there any countries or uh, case studies in, in kind of um, instances where, where in corporate power is kind of posed a problem on the political or ideological level, and there's been kind of a successful pushback against it? Against, against corporate overreach, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think there's a great example of it yet. I mean, look, I can think of some pretty bad examples uh, of what a response I wouldn't want to have. I, what, what, I think it might have been Nigeria that just shut down Twitter in response, saying that, okay, you're going to flag one of my tweets as the dictatorial leader of a country. Well, I'll show you who's in charge and, and ultimately gets rid of it. I mean, I think China prevented the, the uh, IPO of Ant Group, Jack Ma's spinoff from Alibaba, because Jack Ma made some comments that were critical of the Chinese Communist Party, and that's how they retaliated. I'm not sure that's the country I want to live in that uses state power to flex its muscle to, to put corporations back in their place. I don't know that that's the American way. And so as I think about, uh, you know, as I think about good examples elsewhere, I think, I think they're few and far between to find. I think that this is one of the areas where America is going to have to lead the way in recognizing that we're a country defined both based on capitalism and on democracy, both on individualism and on unity, both on pursuing the American dream, but also being part of something that's greater than ourselves. That's what our system of capitalism and democracy is all about. And, and not to be overly idealistic about it, but I think that America is an idealistic place and we ought, to, we ought to not forget the fact that 1776 was the year of not just the Declaration of Independence, but the wealth of nations not just the country of dem democracy, but the country that embodies capitalism too. And yes, those ideals of individualism and unity are somehow in tension with one another, but that's the productive, creative tension that is at the heart of America's core, at the heart of America's soul. And I think that we are gonna have to, if anyone's gonna lead the way in how we keep capitalism and democracy apart from one another to restore a true American pluralism where the two aren't amalgamated to become one hybrid bastardization of the other, but rather preserved as, as institutions of integrity in their own right, separating capitalism from democracy is the core argument I make in the book. America is gonna to have to lead the way in figuring that out because we're the ideal nation that embodies the, that creative tension between the two. And I think that's actually what true American pluralism is all about, is reviving the pluralism of urges within each of us to both be our own individual, yet also to be part of something greater than ourselves. Respectively, that's what capitalism and democracy are both about. And I think that is what we're going to need to revive as a component of American identity if we have any chance of finding our way out of this cultural epidemic. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Ramaswamy. It was a real pleasure to get to talk to you today. 
Um, and thank you for joining us with the Buckley program. Thank you. It was a uh, it was it was a real pleasure, and and I hope you guys you guys uh, lead in ways that that uh, that our country needs right now. So thanks for taking an interest in the talk, and and thanks for having me. And I think for all of our audience members, thanks for coming. And also, you can find Mr. Ramaswamy's book on on Amazon. Thank you. <laughs>